Okay. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about contraception. Um, what I thought I'd do in a limited amount of time I have is to just overview the key considerations fairly quickly uh, when deciding which method of contraceptive to prescribe your patients. Um, my discussion is, of course, going to have a bias or a flavour towards the contraceptive choices that you may make for your patients and with your patients, but in the context of their concurrent uh, gynaecological problems. I'm going to talk about some selected oral contraceptives, the fairly new Nuvering from Organon, um, a little bit of update about the Mirena in Tutrine system, and then, of course, as a gynaecology surgeon, I'll talk, talk a little bit about uh, surgical methods as well. So um, one of the key considerations is, of course, efficacy, uh, contraceptive efficacy, when you're deciding on which method to recommend to your patients. And this is very acutely linked with the patient's age. STI prevention. Of course, uh, in the younger group of ladies, they may want to come to you with uh, desire for contraception. Uh, they may be very fertile, and you may want to recommend they're using condoms in addition to your hormonal uh, methods. Reversibility and irreversibility. Um, again, that's nothing new, but it is an important consideration. Patient compliance, and this comes back later when I'm talking about some of the specific types of contraception uh, here. Um, but Again, patients know what they want. As we've heard already before, the internet now is a very important resource and patients will often come to you uh, with either failed uh, alternative methods previously or very specific questions about specific devices related to that. Um, again, concurrent medical comorbidities. There's a standard checklist of questions about migraines and diabetes and smoking and BMI and hypertension and goodness knows what that we all know about. But also, as I mentioned already, concurrent gynaecological problems, because certain uh, contraceptives, as we know, will very much affect the menstrual cycle, and that can be to the benefit um, of the patient, although their primary presentation may, of course, be purely for contraception. So some patients now, they'll come, they may not want to have any periods. Some of them might not like not having periods because they think they're pregnant. They might want to have a very regular, predictable cycle. And of course, it may not necessarily be a gynaecological diagnosis, but dysfunctional uterine bleeding is a physiological process that patients don't want. They don't want these periods every month. So this is another important uh, touch on patient choice, patient agenda. And as, as always has been the case, social circumstances, are they in a single relationship? Are they in a, uh, you know, uh, are they very mobile population or et cetera, et cetera? And of course, cost. So I'm uh, moving forward to the combined oral contraceptive pill. Again, it's not new. Um, I sort of summarise all the questions which I'm regularly asked about. Is it safe? Uh, and actually, yes, it's more safe uh, to be on a contraceptive pill than not to be on a contraceptive pill. Specifically, I'm going to talk, rather than go through all the different ones and all the very, very subtle differences that they've all got, but specifically to talk about Clara. <coughs> That's the correct pronunciation. It's a relatively new product, and it's specifically licensed for menorrhagia. And this might be useful in women who have been on a combined pill and are quite happy with taking the pill, but still feel that their periods are too heavy. You probably see, let me just point it to work. Um, there's actually four different strengths of slightly different coloured pills and the dummy pills there, so it sort of very much gives you more of a physiological um, pattern to the hormone, I suppose. Um, but the downside of that is that if you miss a pill, it's quite complicated to advise the lady about what you actually do about it, because it depends which pill you miss. Um, Cost £25 for a three cycle pack. It's not quite as cheap as uh, you know your sort of microgyne on, but it's fairly competitive. I want to talk about endometriosis. That's another, probably in my world, common complaint. Um, and I think it's fair to say that you know you would just want to abolish the physiological cycle, and any combined oral contraceptive pill which is tricycle will be of benefit to down-regulate endometriosis. And this is where your cost comes in. I'm not going to talk too much about PCOS because I realise Miss Hannah has the floor on that topic later on in the morning. 
but certainly your selection of product uh, if a patient has this condition with hirsutism, acne and all of those sort of high testosterone uh, symptoms would benefit from Dianet or Yasmin type of preparation. Another big group of contraceptives we talk about is progesterone only pill and for this um, topic I've picked out Cerazette. This is a tablet I prescribe fairly frequently as a gynaecologist. It inhibits ovulation, unlike the other um, progesterone-only pills, and the contraceptive efficacy is equivalent with a similar pearl index, 0.4 versus 0.3 for the combined contraceptive pills. So it's better than the uh, older formulations of progesterone-only pills. Another benefit, it has the same missed pill window. So as you know, if you miss a pill within 12 hours with a contraceptive, combined contraceptive, as long as you take another one uh, within that time, then you don't need to use any additional barrier method. And that is the same for the Cerazette. There's a reduced side effect profile because, of course, there's only one, one hormone rather than the estrogen and the progesterone in combination. <coughs> And therefore, its mainstay of uh, use, in my opinion, is that it can be used for patients who can't take oestrogen. So the patients who do suffer with focal migraine or your, you know, over 35-year-old high BMI diabetic <coughs> smoker, for example. I put this sort of tentatively in question marks because um, <coughs> when it comes to the treatment of endometriosis and the hormonal down regulation of a patient with severe pelvic pain as a result of endometriosis, then one would often recommend the combined oral contracept contraceptive pill, as I said. But if it's contraindicated, your next step is a Mirena. Now, of course, some people don't want Mirena. They just refuse to have it. They've had it before. It fell out. They've had the copper call. They don't want it. So there's some theoretical argument to say that if Cerazet inhibits ovulation it's, and they come to you requesting contraception, then it's a logical choice to put them on. Now, I've, I've put also here NuvaRing, and this isn't because it's particularly got any application for gynaecology, but I've noticed patients have come to um, talk to me about it. They've asked me about it. They want to know what I think about it, because it's quite new, and it seems, I don't know if you've had the same experience, but it seems that patients in the community are, are learning about this, and their friends are having it, and they want to know more about it. So as you can see, it's a flexible... Um, ring, uh, it's f f you know five centimetres in diameter. The patient it learns how to put that in themselves very much in the way they might learn how to put in a, 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 you know, a cap or something like that. Um, it, it follows a pattern like the combined oral contraceptive pill and of course it is combined uh, two different types of hormones as well. And the lady will have one single ring in for three weeks and then she'll be advised to remove it. I think the mainstay of certainly I see of advantage for this is it's very good for patients who just forget their pill, they're busy, they can't remember it um, and they forget to take it all the time. Of course your standard historical treat, um, alternative might have been a long acting contraceptive implanon or a coil or something like this in the patients who have poor compliance. But the problem with those, the patient can't maintain that control. They can't maintain that control once they've had their coil put in and their implanon put in. They don't feel as if they've t they take the responsibility themselves. So this is a place I see for this, and it has got high use user satisfaction. It's interesting that it comes up in refer a friend test. This seems to be a. a, a quite an important marker now um, of if we recommend our services in healthcare to our friends and of course we talk to our friends about our contraceptives and they come to talk to me about it as well. Um, apparently there's lower intermenstrual bleeding rates than the combined oral contraceptive pill but I don't find intermenstrual bleeding rates particularly a problem with the combined pill anyway unlike <coughs> the progesterone only pill. It has a similar uh, pearl index in comparison so it's fairly comparative. And the manufacturers would say that you can use it with tampons, although I'd argue you wouldn't need to use it with tampons because you'd be on your period on your week when the ring's out. Uh, but if you need pessaries for treatment for thrush or if you want to use condoms for STI prevention as well and those sorts of things, it's fine. There are occasional expulsions, and again, pretty much like the Clara, the, the disadvantage is there are fairly complicated rules about when it falls out. Of course, if it falls out in the first half of the cycle, within three hours, you can replace the same one. But it falls out in the second half of the cycle, or it's out for prolonged periods, depending on where you are. You need to shift about your, uh, your week off or, or uh, put in a fresh ring. 
Uh, media, we need to keep up to date with all the media in the world and uh, NuvaRing offer a, a service to patients where they will text reminders to patients to change it. And particularly, this is a group of self-selectors self who forget their pills. Uh, and it's about £27 for three cycles, so it's fairly comparable to some of the other ones that we look at for some of the pills. Mirena is not new, is it? But um, the applications, the licence, uh, the use of Mirena just seems to get wider and wider and wider. It's a long-acting intutrine hormonal contraceptive, as you know. Um, and I certainly use this a lot. I'm sure you do too for, as a dual function for men or age. According to the RCOG uh, recent publication, 20% of women of reproductive age are fifth. Um, will come to you uh, with clinically uh, you know, fitting into the criteria for men or age. Uh, another guidance that we follow is that of NICE, which is saying that uh, the Mirena would be used as the first line hormonal treatment for men or age. Now, I know this is quite contentious, um, but nevertheless, it is in there. Um, it, mechanism of action, anovulation, endometrial thinning, and um, hostility to the cervical mucus. One of the disadvantages, but of course, it does, it, you know, with counselling, it's something that patients will accept in my experience, is that it does cause a bit of irregular bleeding for a few months, between four and six months, until the body's got used to it. Um, patients can tolerate this often because they've got horrific periods, so they don't mind slightly less horrific periods for a short period of time if the end is in sight. And certainly by six months of use, if it's going to work, it will work. And by work, I mean... The majority of patients have uh, very light predictable periods or even no periods at all. Contraceptive efficacy, it's better than the pill, it's better than the coil, and actually it's better than sterilisation, male or female. Um, I've talked about endometriosis suppression. It, it, it's, a new, it's not a new product, but it's, been, it's increasingly being used for endometriosis suppression. Certainly we're now offering to put them in at the time of the laparoscopy for the treatment for the endometriosis. Um, partly because of the anovulatory effect, but it's also partly because the endometrium's thin and you get less, less spread of ectopic endometrium to um, other sites in the pelvis and suppresses certainly the pain of endometriosis very effectively. Um, moving on to surgical techniques, so hysteroscopic sterilisation. Um, of course, everybody knows about laparoscopic sterilisation, but more uh, newer techniques are coming on the market now, uh, performing tubal occlusion from inside the tube rather than externally clipping or surgically excising part of the tube. So Bayer have produced a new product, intrafallopian implants, which are, as you can see there from the little diagram, it's sort of like the... Reminds me of the coil in a biro. It's about the same diameter as that. And it's inserted under direct vision through the hysteroscope into the um, fallopian tube um, exits in, into, the, into the uterine cavity. Um, it is uh, endorsed by NICE, and there's a reference for the guidance there. Um, it, a great advantage over um, s traditional surgical techniques is that it can be performed under local anaesthetic um, or sedation, uh, thereby avoiding the risks associated with surgery and with general anaesthesia. It works by inducing scar tissue formation at the site, but it doesn't work immediately. It takes about three months for complete occlusion of the tube at that point to be guaranteed. And of course, very much like male sterilisation vasectomy, the patients are advised not to rely on this method because it won't be guaranteed till three months uh, following treatment. And the company offer uh, a test for tubal patency to confirm that in the way that male sterilisation offers uh, semen analysis to confirm um, complete treatment. As with any surgical procedure, there are some small risks of complications, uh, mainly device migration, um, uh, and of course it can cause perforation at the time of uh, insertion, but this is relatively uncommon, and you can get a little bit of post-operative pain as well. The company um, advise on their website that the patient satisfaction is high for this, and give the PERL index of 0.26. Um, there is a nice, I wanted to get it to play, but I haven't been able to, but on their website there's a nice little video there if you're interested. Uh, it'll show you how uh, these things are inserted. 
My final slide is about laparoscopic tubal ligation. Again, this is not new. It's uh, taken over from the old-fashioned Pomeroy uh, surgical excision of the tube, apart from accepting circumstances such as uh, sterilisation at caesarean section. But in this situation, it's a two-point laparoscopy technique where the um, titanium fill sheet clips are applied over the medial portion of the fallopian tube, as seen in the diagram there. Um, I said it's a laparoscopic procedure, so uh, you know there are some important dis uh, discussion with the patient to be had during consenting and counselling about the risks of surgery of laparoscopy and the risks of anaesthesia. Having said that, it's very useful uh, to consider this take technique if the patient uh, desires permanent contraception and is having a laparoscopy for another reason anyway. It's certainly not uncommon to be uh, p performing ovarian cystectomies and all manner of other uh, small treatments and perform a sterilisation under the same anaesthetic. Um, the advantage of this and the hysteroscopic technique is that depending on where they are in the cycle uh, when you perform the surgery and or depending on the contraception they're on prior to the sterilisation, it's effective either immediately or certainly within two weeks of surgery. And again, the lifetime failure um, of the filchy clip is, uh, is a, an acceptably low um, level. And I still feel that the hysteroscopic surgery is coming in, it's new, my remit is talked to you about updates, new things, what are in the pipeline for the future. But I still feel that laparoscopic tubule ligation does remain the gold standard um, as a certainly long, long-term published data um, for safety. I put that in great, great brackets here because in the NHS, it's a swear word, we have to counsel patients about its irreversibility and so on. But certainly we all live in the real world and in the private sector some patients do understand that they made a mistake when they undertook their permanent tubal ligation in their early 30s and they are in a new relationship and they wish to have another baby and therefore um, there are some uh, you know, there's some good understanding that this is more reversible <laughs> than some of the other techniques which are less reversible. That's me.